Hi and welcome. Buonasera e benvenuti. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for Mary and Esposito talk. There is, there is no such a thing as Italian food. What a wonderful title. I want to thank you all for taking the time. I actually know that more than 350 people sign up for this event as, as of this morning. And they are now zooming in from all across the United States. And I should say a few of them even from Italy. And as you may know right now in Italy, it's midnight. So thank you. This is the inaugural event of our larger project on the New Hampshire Italian American Foodways. And what a better way of start off these events with Mary Ann Esposito. Thank you, Mary Ann. I'm thrilled and honored to have such an amazing speaker today. Yeah, before we start, I want to mention that this event was made possible with funding from the New Hampshire State Council of the Arts and their folk life and traditional arts grant program. We also owe a special thanks for their support to many organizations and individuals. So it's a long list, I'll try to make it short. The College of Liberal Arts Dean Office, the UNH Alumni Relations, the UNH Center for the, for the Humanities, the New Hampshire Humanities, the New NH Department of Women and Gender Studies, the New Hampshire Lakes Region Italian Cultural Club and the Bedford Italian Cultural Society. Thank you, grazie, for supporting us. And on a personal note, I want to thank my colleagues for their amazing support and helping me organizing this event, Professor Amy Boyle, Nicole Gerke, Hero Garofalo, and Anna Wenbright. Grazie. So now, the chair of the Classic Humanities and Italian Study at UNH would like to say a few words to welcome Mary Ann Esposito, and I will hand it over to Professor Smith. Thank you, Professor Mara, and I wanna uh, welcome all of you who have joined us for this wonderful talk by Mary Ann Esposito. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but when I think about this time of year, I start thinking about getting together with family and friends over food, which is such a great cultural connector that brings people together, um, families, friends, but also whole regions. And I really love the talk title tonight, which thinks, it makes us think about how food is not just national, but regional and even individual. And it's a wonderful thing to have Marian Esposito here. And on a personal note, I want to end by saying that I have a connection with Marianne through my wife, Maggie, who back in 1998 got yes. this uh, apron, Ciao Italia, <laughs> and it is signed by Marianne Esposito. She was an intern on her show. Yes. And I want to point out that all the stains are probably bolognese sauce. So it's, it, it's been well used. So I just want to welcome our guest and, and thank her profusely for coming and inspiring us to think about how food is really part of life, life itself. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Professor Mara. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. So it is my great honor today to introduce Mary Ann Esposito, an international chef, a writer, a TV host, and possibly more importantly, a promoter of the Italian culture. She's so well known that I'm tempted to say there is no need for an introduction but I actually don't want to miss the opportunity to honor Mary Ann and her work. So Mary Ann Esposito is the creator and the host of the PBS series Ciao Italia with Mary Ann Esposito. This year, the series celebrates its milestone, 30th year of production, making it America's longest running television cooking series. Congratulations, Mary Ann. I have no words for this. Mary Ann is also the author of 13 cookbooks, including her most recent Ciao Italia, My Lifelong Food Adventure in Italy. Through Ciao Italia and her appearance on TV programs such as Today Show, The Food Network, Discovery Channel, Fox, Rai International, and many others, she has been able to share Italian cooking, history, and culture with audience all around the world. In addition, 
she created the Mary Ann Esposito Foundation to help culinary students to achieve their goals. Now, I want to say, if you read her bio, Mary Ann has taught at Boston University for close to 30 years. Yet, I say with great proud, she graduated from the University of New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> and we are so delighted to have her back, right? I want to mention that. <laughs> so many organizations have recognized Mary Ann for her efforts to preserve the tradition surrounding Italian regional food and culture. She received the Order of the Star of Italy Award from the Presidente della Repubblica Italiana, so the President of Italian Republic, as well as the Premio Artusi for her work in promoting and preserving Italian food. When I told to my friends that I had the honor to invite Mary Ann Esposito for a talk about regional food, many of them enthusiastically brought me back to share how they associate Mary Ann recipe with moments of their own life. <coughs> Neapolitan stuffed bread, casatiello for Easter, panettone for Christmas or Natale, orecchietti with broccoli for a Sunday dinner with family. Mm. So today I invite you to share your memories and type your question using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom page at any time during the talk. And we will read them and share them with you at the end of this talk. So without further ado, it is my great honor to welcome Mary Ann Esposito for her talk, There Is Not Such Thing as Italian Food. Thank you so much, grazie Mary Ann, for being with us today. Oh, grazie, professoressa. That was a wonderful introduction. And um, I want to say that uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to speak with you tonight. And uh, I hope that I can impart some little words of wisdom as we go through some of the slides. I don't know if I'll get through all of them, but uh, uh, with the help of Andy, our guru there at the switch, we'll be able to uh, cover a lot of them. So in 1989, I started my first program here at the University of New Hampshire. And um, in that first program, I made that bold statement that there is no such thing as Italian food. There is only regional food. And that became the mission of Ciao Italia to teach a larger audience that Italian food is not spaghetti and meatballs and deep dish Chicago style pizza and pizza with pepperoni as Italian Americans or Americans know it. So I started out by telling people that you have to think regionally when you think about Italian food. And that's why we have this first map because in order to understand Italian regional food, you have to understand three things, I think. Number one, geography. Number two, migration and mobility. And number three, oral tradition. Because it might surprise you to know that most quote recipes do not exist in the Italian repertoire. Most of what we know and what has been handed down to us as Italian regional food comes from what was available at the time. So let's look at this map because I wanted, if you can just think about dividing this map into three sections. And I know we can't use a, I can't use a cursor to go along this map, but if you, if you took this map and you divided it in thirds. So if we went from the Trentino to Toscana, that's one third. Then we go from the Marche, down to Lazio, that's the second third. And then we divide, the, the rest of this is in is Southern Italy. So why did I divide it into three like that? Because the ingredients, the foods, the terroir that makes up these three distinct big regions is why we have the kind of food that we do. So if you could glance over to where Torino is on the, on the uh, uh, 
uh, on the in the Piedmont section of your map there, the orange section on the left, you see Torino. And then if you just follow Torino across to where it says the Gulf of Venice, this is the area that we know as the area of the Po River. This is the way the Po River flows across to the east into the Gulf of Venice. Now, why is that important? It's important because this is the area that we know you can grow such things as rice, right? You can, you can grow uh, corn. You have a lot of these kinds of products that come from this area that could not necessarily come from someplace else. If you go a little further down in that first section, you come to Emilia Romagna. If you've ever traveled in Emilia Romagna, you know that this particular region is known for its very rich food, especially around Bologna. Bologna is called Bologna La Grassa, and it's called that because it has rich food. But what kinds of rich food does it have that they don't have further north, where they have stews and polentas and rice? In Emilia Romagna, especially around Bologna, you have tortellini, right? You have tagliatelle. You have some of the classic products like prosciutto di parma. You have um, a, a balsamic vinegar. So you have things here that you would not find in the first part of that, uh, first third of that region. And why? Well, because Bologna is in a very fertile area. It's a great place for, for grazing. So this is why we can have prosciutto di parma, which is a very specialized type of ham that is only air cured with salt. And you can have rich sauces. Rich sauces come from here. Lasagna alla bolognese, lasagna verde alla bolognese, which are not dishes that you would find in the Veneto. In the Veneto, you would find dishes like seafood dishes. You would find risotto because of course you have what areas where risotto uh, where rice growing takes place. If you move further down into this section into uh, Toscana, this is an area where people here, especially around Florence, are often referred to as, um, they're, they're bean eaters, mangia fagioli. Whereas where Anna comes from in the Friuli in the North, you're known as mangia polenta, as we were talking a, a little earlier, because you could grow corn there, you can make polenta. In Florence, particularly, where a lot of tourists like to go, you have very simple foods. Often this area is known as foods that are of, of the cucina povera tradition. They're very simple foods. They're not, they're not heavily seasoned. They're not rich like the foods from uh, Bologna. So what kind of food would you eat if you were going to Florence? Well, you would, you'd be eating beans, particularly the cannellini beans, which they often cooked in a flask. Think of it as, as the baked beans of, of Florence. You would eat the classic bistecca alla Fiorentina, which is beef, but it comes from a certain kind of cow, the, the Chianina cow. So if you're in Florence, you don't want to order risotto, although you can, I'm not saying that that's not possible, but you want to think about eating the foods that come from that particular region or area. Then if you go for on further, you come into Umbria, the only landlocked region of Italy, which has a very large lake, Lago Trasimeno. And here, this is pork country. This is where you want to eat porchetta, where you want to eat truffles, where you want to eat the lenticchie di Castelluccio, the, the lentils that come from this particular uh, region. And then as we come on down to Rome, the region of Lazio, we talk about some of those classic dishes. Like right now it's Easter time. And what would the Romans be making for Easter right now? 
Well, they would be making lamb, roast lamb, of course. They would be making artichokes, stuffed artichokes. A very famous restaurant in, around, in Rome it, near the, uh, the Jewish area is a restaurant called Il Piperno. And this is a classic area where artichokes are prepared. And the reason that artichokes are so famous here is because of the Jewish community that lived in Rome and really taught the Romans how to prepare uh, artichokes. One of the classic dishes from there is something called the uh, carciofi alla Judea, which means Jewish style uh, artichokes. Then if you went over to Abruzzo and Molise, which these two regions at one time were combined into one, you find the similar cooking from Rome. You have a lot of lamb dishes, you have a lot of braised dishes, pasta dishes, pasta that's made with water and semolina, as opposed to the pastas of Emilia Romagna, which are made with egg and unbleached all-purpose flour, a very different thing altogether. So I'm just trying to give you some differentiations between these regions. Then if you came on down to Napoli, of course, what would you, if you were a tourist, what would you want to be eating in Naples? Naples is the land of the tomato. Put the tomato on the map. It's also the land of pasta, right? It's also the land of pizza. It's the land of sfogliatelle. It's, it's the land of the pastiera. I could go on and on. But Neapolitan cooking is very much based in very hot growing types of vegetables because they have the climate for it. So tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, those kinds of things grow really well in, uh, in Campania. And then the cooking becomes is very similar in Basilicata, Puglia, but Puglia is known especially for its olive oil because it has some of the oldest olive trees in the world. If you've ever visited Puglia and you're driving along, you see these olive trees that have these trunks that are, they're absolutely enormous. And why do they grow so well there? Because for olive trees, you need a very chalky soil. You need a dry, arid conditions. These are conditions that you find in this region. Calabria is the land of peppers, il diavolo. So if you're in Calabria, you're gonna eat a lot of dishes with peppers. And then of course, we come to my homeland, Sicily. And Sicily is really a hodgepodge of so many cultures that we can't say that there is a Sicilian cuisine, just like we can't say there's an, an Italian cuisine. So I hope that just kind of sets the scene for you a little bit. So running along the center, right from Lombardia all the way down to Campo Basso Avellino, you have the Apennine Mountains, the spine of Italy. And we all know, looking at the map, this Italy is a peninsula. So immediately comes to mind that, oh, this is, you know, there's going to be a lot of fish. But you would be surprised to know that there are some areas that do not support a fish culture. Sardinia is one of them. And if I, get, if I could get to that later, I'll explain why. So you have these, this mountain range. You have, you have uh, what was in the past, the inability to move from place to place because of this mountain range. You had, you know, there, there were no cars, planes, trains, and automobiles. You were pretty much localized to where you were born. This was so true for my grandparents. My grandmother came from the center of Sicily in a region, in an area, a province called Caltanissetta. And she only knew the cooking of Caltanissetta within a very restricted area because there was no mobility. And so this is how recipes became so localized to this very day because of the way people were not able to move. So you could go door to door today. I don't care where you go and in, in what region you go. Let's take Naples. You go door to door and you ask somebody, how do you make a salsa di pomodoro? And as many doors as you hit on, 
you will get that many answers. Nobody will tell you that they make their sauce exactly like this. This is the difference between Italian regional cooking and I'm gonna use France as an example, French cooking. Because if you went door to door in France, in Paris, let's say, and you wanted to know how to make a bechamel sauce, which is a white sauce, every door you knocked on would tell you, give you the exact formula. This is how you make a bechamel. Because French cooking is much more categorized than Italian regional cooking ever was. So there really is, as I said earlier, there were no recipes. This was all from what you had and how you used your wits to combine it into something to make food. So you have the mountains, you have the, the inability to move the mobility, and then you have the oral tradition. And oral tradition is what really Italian recipes have come down to be. I'll give you a perfect example. When I wrote my first cookbook, Ciao Italia, which was based on the, the first season uh, of the show, I uh, compiled in this book a lot of family recipes that came from Avellino and also from Caltanissetta because I had two grandmothers who lived with us. So we were in that culture when we were indoors and when we were outside, we were back in America again. Okay, so when I wrote my cookbook, I wanted to put a recipe in there that I recalled that one of my grandmother's uh, friends made and her name was Rita Ritchie. And she made these nut cookies, these Italian nut cookies, which I remembered were absolutely wonderful. So I called my mother. I said, mom, can you send me the recipe for Rita Ritchie's cookies? Yes, no problem. In the mail, because that was before the days of the internet, came this recipe card. And on it, it said, at the top, Rita Ritchie's cookies makes one bushel, add flour, put some eggs in, add sugar. When it feels good, make the cookie. Now, now that, that, that was the way women at that time worked. That's what they did for recipes. They just did it from feel and from what they knew. So oral tradition has really uh, defined what we know today, what a lot of us think is Italian regional cooking that really has come down to be Italian Americanized cooking. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide, Andy. So why do we go to Italy in the first place? Why, why are we so fascinated by it? I think we're fascinated by it for so many reasons. It's the most visited country in the world. And I don't know anyone who goes to Italy that comes back and says they didn't have a grand time. Oh, maybe there was one, but it's because there was a lot of walking involved. But I go to Italy because I want to learn about the history, not just of the food, but of the places that I go. Because believe it or not, you can have no history without food, and you can have no food without history. So we go because we want to understand this place. We want to, we want to kind of have a foundation of what, how does Italy speak to us? And this is how Italy speaks to me. I look at this temple and say, just, and I say, how did they ever build this? I had to put my mind aside, in, in other words. I, I couldn't think, you know, well, there was a crane or there was a pulley, there was a this, there was none of that. Tutto a mano, as they say. So we go because we want to learn about the history. Okay, Andy. Andy, next slide. And one of the places that we often start this journey when we go to Italy is in Rome, because Rome, of course, is the center. It's la città eternità, right? The eternal city. And so for most of us, journey to understand Italy, to understand its history, the people, the culture is Rome. And I've made so many, many trips to Rome and I still don't understand Rome. There's just too much to absorb in this country that's only 750 miles long, the size of Arizona. Next slide. Now, I said earlier when we were looking at the map 
that geography has a lot to do with the food and it truly does. Now this is Capri on the Amalfi Coast. And, and if you've been there, you know that this is one of probably the most beautiful places in the world, not just in Italy. Very serene. It's named Capri after the goats that lived on this island. So it's not Capri, it's Cap Capri. And as I say, named for the goats. And when you go to Capri, you are kind of immersed in uh, eye candy, so to speak, because everything is brilliant, beautiful. There's lemon trees, orange trees, there's capers, there's octopus, there's, there's people, there's, there's trinket shops, there's everything. And Capri, because it is uh, a little bit isolated in a sense, really kept its regional food traditions alive. So the food there is very simply prepared. One of the things I particularly like, I just mentioned was the octopus salad that they make in Capri with the wonderful um, lemons, which have a taste all their own, and the capers that go along with this dish. And you think to yourself, yes, Capri, that makes sense. There would be a lot of fish dishes. And that's true. You would want to eat fish when you were, when you were in Capri. So the geography kind of colors what the foods will be in that particular locale. And the terroir is what gives the flavor. Now, when I write a cookbook, the first thing I say to people is use as many uh, Italian ingredients that you can get your hands on. I mean, I'm talking about real authentic things. Obviously, we, we do not have the lemons that come from Amalfi, but you can get capers uh, in jars, you can get products if you're cooking other things that are not from, from uh, particularly Capri, but you can get things like cheeses and, and, and uh, salumi and tomatoes and olive oil and aceto balsamico, those things you can get. So if you're doing some, a, a recipe, you wanna get as close to the original flavor as you can get. You'll never duplicate it, never, but you will come close. Next slide. Again, look at this picture. This is Matera in Basilicata in the south of Italy. This has uh, been a very famous place for uh, movie uh, production, for filming. Um, and it's known for its caves, which are called the Sassi. And the Sassi were these stone buildings you see, and they're built, uh, these are houses built right on top of one another. And until 1950, people lived in these caves without running water, without electricity, oftentimes with animals in the same one room uh, that they had in, in this dwelling. And then in 1950, the, the Italian government close this all down because it, it, would be, it was becoming disease uh, infested. Today, Matera, which was a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site declared a heritage site a couple of years ago, is a bustling tourist destination because these sassi, these caves have now been turned into hotels and, and restaurants. And of course, you know, with the, with the pandemic, of course, nobody's going anywhere. But here you will find some of the purest foods of Italy because just look at this picture. Think about years ago, how would you ever get out of here? So you were pretty much immobilized. And so whatever you created as food remained in, in this area. So tomato-based and peppers, simple breads, pastas made with semolina flour and water became the mainstay of um, Basilicata. Next slide. And of course, we all think that the foods of the bigger cities, the stars will you, you know, if you have, uh, if you want to think about stars of Italy, you think of the big cities, you think of Florence, you think of Rome, you think of Milan, you know, you don't think so much about the smaller places. And these bigger places 
like Florence, they're a magnet for us because we've heard more about them, these places, than we have about Basilicata. Maybe some people don't know where Basilicata is or Molise or uh, some other region, Friuli, for instance, where is that? But in our minds, we think because we've been inundated with Florence, Rome, Florence, Rome, that this is Italy. Well, this is only a part of Italy. And this is really a glorified version of Italy. Because I wager you that when you're in Florence and you're just, you don't know where to look next at the Duomo or the Baptistry or the Uffizi, you just don't know where to look next. The food in Florence will not be as authentic as the food in Basilicata. And why is that? Because who are we catering to in Florence? A lot of tourists who, you know, expect a little bit more refinement, expect things to be uh, what they imagine Flor Florentine food would be. I think one of the worst things I've ever seen in Florence is somebody ordering a bistecca, which usually just, you know, is warmed over. I mean, when you order a bistecca, you better not order it well done because they'll probably throw you out of the restaurant. But a bistecca, which is a porterhouse steak actually, should kind of just be warmed over on both sides, over coals, uh, over a, a wood fire. And then it's drizzled with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. It's, it's anointed with some salt and pepper and maybe a little bit of arugula on the side. And that's the classic bisteca. But would you ever, ever order it with a cappuccino? And this is truly done. So I get a little upset when I see things like that because I think people should do their homework and know where they're going and what the customs are and what the and what is a no-no? And having a cappuccino with a bisteca to me is a mortal sin. Anyway, enough said, next slide. One of my fascinations, I think if I, if I were not a cook, I would have been an archeologist because I, I, I love anything that has to do with archeology, span uncovering anything. And every time I go to Pompeii, I, I'm just, I'm stunned by just walking around. Now, they just re recently discovered some new fast food areas uh, in Pompeii that they have uncovered. And, you know, the, the, Ro the, the Pompeians and the Romans who went there on holiday were very much like us in many ways. They wanted fast food. They would go and they would order these fast food type dishes. You know, they were kind of not as it so much in a hurry as we are, we were, but, but they were still in a hurry. And when I walk around there, I wonder what, what, what was like life really like here? And I particularly love this painting. This is Terentius Nail and his wife. And I want to say to myself that they're writing a cookbook. You see how they're just very pensive. They're not, uh, they're not of imperial status. She has a stylus in her hand and she's got a kind of like a, a little book in her hand. And I, I just like fantasizing about things like this. Like, what were these people really like? How much like us were they? And so whenever I'm in Italy, I kind of scout these kinds of things out because I can learn something about food that I didn't know before. For instance, whenever I'm walking along the streets in Pompeii, you can see those petrified breads that they found. And they look just like breads we make today, round loaves that are scored in four, uh, with four slashes across the top. It looks very modern. So I love this connection that we should have to history. You cannot separate food and history. Next slide. Now, besides wanting to be an archeologist, I would have loved to have been, you know, lived in the Renaissance. My husband always says, yeah, you would have loved it as long as you had a, a, a flushing toilet and a shower. And that's probably true. 
But in uh, the Palazzo Publico in Siena, if you've ever been there, this is Simone Martini's painting of the Maesta, which is the, uh, the Virgin uh, in Majesty. And the reason I, I put this here is because I want to say to myself, there's so much to Italian culture besides the food. There is this, there is the artistic ability of so many artists who lived at this time, who have brought so much to what is my ancestry. I'm very proud of that. So Italy is, it's about history. It's about those wonderful monuments that I just pointed out. It's about archeology. span It's about art. Next slide. And we can learn a lot about how people lived by looking at the artwork. This is probably one of my favorites by Ambrogio Lorenzetti, who did this big, huge mural in the Palazzo Publico. This is what happens he's telling us, when you have bad government. You can't see the whole thing here because I wasn't able to get the whole thing on, on the slide, but when you have bad government, you have people who are not trustworthy, who's depicted here like the devil. Things start to go bad. Things start to crumble. You can't grow anything. There's no organization. People are in disarray. There's no food. There's famine. All of this is happening because we, are, we do not have trustworthy leaders. But, next slide, if we have good government, which means we have trustworthy people, then things survive and thrive. And in this particular mural, if we could see the whole thing, which we can't, the vineyards are flush. The farmlands are bustling. The sheep are out in the meadow grazing. People are working. Everyone is happy. And this makes for good government. So in paintings like this, you can learn things about food because you can see the types of things that they were growing at the time. Next slide. And then I said that, you know, we, we have to think about the oral tradition. We talked about the geography, the mobility, and the oral tradition. And one of my favorite things to do whenever I'm in Sicily is to go to Palermo to the Opera dei Pupi, which is a puppet show. And one year I was taking a group to Sicily and I said that I was going to go to a puppet show and they thought I was crazy. But as soon as I told them why I was going to the puppet show, they all wanted to come. So this is a tradition that I hope is not going to be lost in Sicily. Palermo has the best uh, tradition of the Opera dei Pupi and this is uh, an ongoing saga, a story about Rolando and his fight with the Saracens. So there's always fighting going on. But what's great about this is how these puppets are made and how they're operated and the story that they tell. Now, you can't see this, but above these puppets is someone who's holding onto these different the strings. And that person has to not only be the character of the puppet, has to speak for the puppet, has to move the puppet's uh, eyeballs and arms, and also has to work his sword fighting these other puppets. And it's really amazing to watch because you, you can't, you think, how is he doing that? How can he chop somebody's head off when he's trying to also tell the story, move the puppet's eyes, it's, it's just amazing. So I, for me, having this kind of thing to, uh, to be part of Sicilian tradition is, is very important because I don't want to see traditions like this lost. And that's why we do Ciao Italia because we don't want to see food traditions lost. So if you ever get to Palermo or you've been in Palermo, you've got to go 
to an opera dei pupi. I, I promise you, you will love it. Next slide. All right, finally, I'm getting to the food part. Okay, so of course, everyone loves Italian food, right? You go to Italy and again, it's, you go to the markets, you walk around the different neighborhoods and the markets can tell you so much about the culture of the place, about the people, just by looking at the different foods that are there. And one of the things I learned early on when I was uh, in the markets, this was especially true in Perugia, I went to the central market and I went downstairs and I wanted to buy uh, 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 zucca gialla, se a seed, semi di zucca gialla. This is a pumpkin, a, a really intense orange looking pumpkin that you use as a filling for a, uh, a ravioli. So I see the signora and I'm looking, I don't see the seeds or anything. So I flag her down and I come over and she comes over and I tell her what I'm looking for. And she's, oh yes, yeah, I have them. So she goes, she gets the seeds. And then she brings them over to me and she says to me, what are you going to do with that? I said, well, I, I'm, going, I'm going to make the uh, ravioli with the zucca di, the, uh, zucca di gialla. And she looked at me because that's the filling and it has amaretti cookies and Parmesan cheese in it. She looked at me and she said, how do you do that? Now, that was the moment that I realized that maybe Ciao Italia did have a mission because I'm talking to an Italian, a native. I'm a third generation Italian American. And she's asking me how to make this particular dish when I should have been asking her. So that kind of hit home. But anyway, in the market, you can find things that come from many of the different regions of Italy. And the thing about Italian regional food is that you only cook what's in season. That's one of the big tenets of what Italian regional food is. You cook with things that are in season because they're very, very fresh. So if you go, you know, in the summer and you want pears, they're going to tell you non è stagione. So it's not the season for pears. The other thing you'll find when you go into the market is that big sign that says non toccare. It's one of my favorite sayings, non toccare, which means do not touch. So it's not like here where, you know, we go in the grocery store and picking through the apples and the peaches and the pears. No, no, it's not like that at all. You tell the fruit of vendo what you're going to do. Think about this. When was the last time you were in a grocery store and the guy in the produce department cared about what you were picking out, right? He's doing his job and he can't wait to get out, out of there so he can go to lunch. No. Instead, in Italy, and this is why food is just so important, the fruit of vendo says, what are you going to make with that? And in this case, I was making a pear tart for friends of mine who were coming from Reggio Emilia and I was renting a house uh, in Italy. And I said, well, I wanna make, uh, I wanna make this tart, una torta di pere. And he says, no, you don't want that pear. You want this pear. Cause this pear is duro, it's hard. You don't want this pear over here because it's too mushy. It's too soft to do for a, a pear tart. Just taking the time to explain to you how and why you would use a particular fruit or vegetable. So classic Italian. And then once you have these fresh ingredients, what do you, the thing is you keep the treatment simple, simple. Again, the difference between Italian regional cooking, and I'm gonna use France as an example, is that in French cooking, you have more complication. In Italian cooking, you have simplicity. So grilled uh, egg, uh, grilled uh, zucchini, for instance. What do you do to grilled zucchini? You put a little extra drizzle of extra virgin olive oil, which has a wonderful flavor unto its own, a little salt and pepper, you're done. You don't have to make a cream sauce. You don't have to steam it. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Keep the treatment simple. Buy local keep the treatment simple. Next slide. One of the classic, classic ingredients for Italian regional cooking, especially from two thirds of the boot down, 
is olive oil. We know that in Northern Italy, butter has been uh, the, the, uh, the fat of choice, but now that's changing too. So olives, olives, there are over 350 kinds of olives growing in Italy. And depending on where they're grown in what kind of soil they're grown will determine their flavor. So when people say to me, well, which olive oil should I buy? My answer is, well, you know, this is like asking me, what kind of wine do I like to drink? You have a preference. Do you like dry wines? Do you like sweet wines, in between wines? What do you like? Well, the same thing is true of olive oil. Do you like fruity olive oil? Do you like olive oil that has a little bit of a burn in your throat? Do you want something lighter? Well, in order to understand olive oils, you have to try them. You have to experiment with them. So the olive oil is the basic foundation for Italian regional cooking. Next slide. But you want to be careful about when you buy olive oil. And I use this, these bottles as an example. A few years ago in the New York Times, I believe it was, there was an article about this, the bastardization of people of olive oil buying in the United States. People weren't buying the real thing. And they weren't. Because, because it said olive oil, they figured, well, it's from Italy, right? No, you have to be like a detective. And this particular olive oil says on the bottle, PDO. Now, that tells me something. These, these are little tricks that you got to look for. PDO means, or DOP, Denominazione Origine Protetta. In other words, this olive oil in this bottle is actually produced and bottled in Italy. And as you look down further, you see this little yellow crest down here. And that tells you that the European Union has stamped this as such. This particular olive oil comes from around Salerno in Southern Italy. And you see over here on, the, on, the, uh, on this, uh, I don't know where it is on your screen, but it says first cold press. That's another tip off. Because extra virgin olive oil must come from the very first pressing of the olives. And it must be cold pressed. So no extraneous heat was used to extract the oil. And it must have less than 1% acidity. That's what characterizes it uh, as extra virgin olive oil. And then down below, it says product of Italy. So you want to look for that DOP or the PDO. You want to look for that European Union symbol. And you want to look for that, uh, those words that say first cold pressed. Next slide. So. I told you this came from around Salerno. So it says there, Colline Salern Salernitane, in other words, around the hills of Salerno. Now, there is so much confusion because this says product of Italy, but you know what? A lot of bogus stuff can say that too. And here's why bogus olive oil can say product of Italy. Because in the Mediterranean, you have an Italian ship, big ship, where they produce olive oil. But on this ship is coming olives from Tunisia, from Greece, uh, from other Turkey, other places, different olives coming from different areas, different countries. And they're all brought to this ship, this ship that's in Italian waters. And so it's processed and I don't know, you know, pressed and all that. And they can call it product of Italy because the ship is in Italian waters. So unless you see that European uh, emblem, the little round orange thing that I showed you, and the PDO, you're not getting something that comes from a particular region of Italy. You're getting something that's maybe a blend of different uh, olive oils in different uh, categories of olives. Maybe they're bruised olives. Maybe, you know, they're not the best olives that, that could be used for the olive oil. Maybe they weren't cold pressed. So you've got to be 
really careful and you gotta do your homework. And extra virgin olive oil is really a, a condimento. You don't really wanna deep fry with this. You would never do that because it's, first of all, it's very expensive. And secondly, the heat would destroy the flavor of the olive oil. And olive oil is always in a dark bottle. It's always in a dark bottle because light is another factor that will affect its flavor. Next slide. Again, just showing you that you want to be careful. And this particular olive oil, you can actually buy online. I mean, I, I have nothing to do with this company, but I'm just using this as an example. You can actually go online and find very good olive oils. But again, you, you, have, to, you have to decide what kind of olive oil, what flavor do you like? If, if you like olive oils from the south of Italy, from Puglia, from Bizzicata, from Sicily, they're going to be a little bit denser and they're going to be a little bit more peppery. If you go up further north towards Liguria, the, the olive oils tend to be a little lighter. Umbrian olive oil, Tuscan olive oil, Ligurian olive oil. They don't have the same characteristics as your deep, deep south uh, olive oils. Next slide. Allora, my favorite topic, the plum tomato. Okay, so you're growing a garden this year, right? And you're putting in San Marzano, right? And by August, you're gonna be giving away tons of San Marzano tomatoes. Well, I'm here to tell you that you're not growing San Marzano and you're not giving away San Marzano tomatoes. What you're growing are plum tomatoes. This is a plum tomato that came out of my garden. This is something called a redorta. Uh, a redorta is a, a very meaty, beefy plum tomato with low acidity. Uh, and few seeds, and they come from uh, Franchi, Franchi seeds in Bergamo in Lombardia, where their where their uh, consortia is located. But you can find Franchi seeds anywhere. Next slide. Okay, I told you you're not you're not growing San Marzano. You're probably not buying San Marzano unless you see this. Again, you see this D O P San Marzano. Mangiare bene a lunga la vita. You know, eat well and live long. So in order for a plum tomato to be categorized as a San Marzano, it has to be grown in San Marzano. No ands, ifs, or buts. Otherwise, it's just a plum tomato. So it drives me crazy when people tell me that they're, they're growing San Marzanos. San Marzano tomatoes um, are always whole, if you're buying them in a can, you can find them and you can get them. They're always whole. So if you see on the can, it says, you know, a pureed or cutting bits, you don't want that because that is not how a San Marzano can be packaged according to the consortia, a ruling body that oversees how these tomatoes are grown and how they are processed. So they're put into, jar, into cans. And then of course they will have that European seal, and it must say San Marzano DOP. Otherwise, it's just a generic plum tomato. And this is the tomato that Italians love to use for making sauces, la salsa di pomodoro, not gravy. We're making sauce. Gravy is something you put on, on meat. Next slide. Now, this, this was a real, real prize this year in my garden. These uh, are a small tomatoes. They, they're, they're actually, I shouldn't say small. They're like cherry tomatoes that have a little a point at the end. And they are pienolo tomatoes, pienolo. And they're so called because it, this is the tomato that Italians string up on hemp or some sort of a, a rope. And they hang them in bunches, you've seen this. And then they hang, they let them dry and they use them then through the, the months of the year where they, you know, they're not growing tomatoes. So I brought these seeds home uh, from Italy. Italy. Uh, they grow at the base of Mount Vesuvius and they are the sweetest, most wonderful tomato. And that, that little point is, it's just, I don't know, I love them. Don't, don't they look great? And they taste wonderful and they're good for drying too. And you can make sauce out of them, but they're also good as just a, a salad tomato. So that's the Pianolo del Vesuvio. Next slide. All right, we've talked about olive oil. We've talked about 
um, uh, we talked about tomatoes, classic foods of Italy. And of course, you can't go anywhere without talking about pasta. And there's a difference as to pastas and where they come from in Italy. So for regional pastas, if you want fresh pasta, pasta fresca, you're going to start out with a dopozero flour, which is like our unbleached all-purpose flour. In Italian, it's dopozero. And this uh, is, it has about 13% protein, the flour does. And to make fresh pasta, there is no recipe. There's, you put the, you put the flour on, the, on a board. You make a hole in the center. You add the eggs, a little bit of salt. You make a dough. When it feels right, you've got pasta. So unbleached all-purpose flour or dobozero dobo and eggs and salt. Those are the classic ingredients for making fresh pasta. Now that's not to say that in different parts of Italy where they do make fresh pasta, there aren't some variations. For instance, in some locales in Emilia Romagna, the lady over here, she adds five eggs to her flour, but the lady over here only adds the egg yolks. And the lady over there, she adds only some eggs and a little bit of white wine. And the lady over here, she adds a drop of olive oil. I think you get my point. There are so many variations on how to make pasta. But the one that we all kind of know is eggs and flour and salt. That's very different than pasta seca, which means dried pasta. Because for dried pasta, which includes things that you buy in a box, you know, like rigatoni, gemelli, uh, farfalle, a spaghetti, um, linguine, any of those that you buy in a box, those are made from semolina flour, which is a hard wheat flour and water. And the reason that shortcuts of pasta like rigatoni, farfalle, uh, gemelli, uh, fusilli, the reason those pastas need this type of flour is because being a hard wheat flour, you can extrude this flour with mixed with water through bronze dyes. In other words, you're giving it a form. So the pasta is going through a machine that has a disc in it that makes the form, whether it is the, the, the swirl, uh, the spiral type pasta, or it's the farfalle or whatever it is. You wouldn't be able to do that with just the unbleached all-purpose flour and the eggs. It would not hold up it through the bronze dyes. So whenever you are buying dried pastas, pasta seca, you should look on the box to see, has the pasta been extruded through bronze dyes? And the reason you want that is because if you've ever really looked at pasta that has been extruded through bronze dyes, you'll notice that it has a very rough surface and that's intentional because many pastas that you buy, the dried pastas, don't, aren't extruded through bronze dyes. They're extruded through Teflon dyes. And the Teflon dyes make a very smooth surface. And that's a problem. If you've ever tried to sauce pasta extruded through Teflon dyes, where's all the sauce? In the bottom of the dish. Whereas the rough hued ones, with the semolina flour have that roughness to them, which traps that sauce. And so now the sauce is around the pasta and in the little grooves, and it's not in the bottom of the bowl. People think they know how to cook pasta. Well, they may, but they don't understand the language behind cooking pasta. For instance, the classic thing, al dente, I think that drives most people crazy. What really does it mean? I mean, to say it's to the tooth doesn't tell you anything. What are you supposed to do, feel your tooth? I mean, is, what does that tell you? No, it's better to say if you're going to cook pasta, a dried pasta, because fresh pasta cooks in two minutes 
as opposed to dried pasta that's gonna take between eight and 12 minutes to come to that al dente stage. And here's what I tell people. If you're cooking dried pasta, you wanna know when it's cooked? Fish a piece of it out of the water. Let's say it's a rigatoni. So you take a rigatoni out and you cut it in half and you look in the center. And if you see any white there, which means there's flour still yet to be cooked, you throw that back in the water until you can fish out another piece and you don't see any white uncooked flour. Then you know that the pasta is cooked. So the difference between fresh pasta and, and dried are the flours used and how they are extruded. Next slide. Cheese. This is another classic Italian food. And some of us are so, I don't know, we're missing out because we're pouring what we think is cheese out of a box, shaking it on our pasta. And we're thinking that is cheese and it's not cheese. I don't even think it's real. Somebody told me there's sawdust in that stuff. I don't know. But if you're going to cook Italian food, use the real ingredients because it will make all the difference in the world. And there are so many different cheeses as there are so many different pastas, so many different olives. There are so many different cheeses. We could be here for a month just talking about cheeses. But some of the more classic cheeses that we all know are Asiago, which comes from the Veneto, from the town of Asiago. These cheeses are named after the places from where they come. So Asiago is a cow's milk cheese. It can, it can be matured in three different uh, stages depending on how long it's aged. But they usually age on boards like this. That's cow's milk cheese. Next, next slide. Parmigiano Reggiano. How you're going to know if you have the real thing? Well, you're not going to buy it grated. That's number one. That's a no-no. You don't go to the store and buy it, it grated in a package. No, you buy it in a wedge, yet like you see it here, because then you can see that it's the real thing. You know how much fake Parmesan cheese is out there? There's a lot of fake Parmesan cheese, but if you buy it in a wedge, you can see those pin dots on the rind that say Parmigiano Reggiano, DOP. This one happens to be from the year 213. This is a cow's milk cheese. It can only come from one place. It has to come from the region of Emilia Romagna. And the words Parmigiano Reggiano are just two areas from where this cheese can be made, Parma and Reggio. There are three other provinces where it can be made, but then that's it. And a consortia oversees how this cheese is made. The milk has to come from a certain breed of cow. The cows have to feed on certain grasses. The milk has to come from a morning and an evening milking. A certain amount of rennet has to be used. When the cheese is in little pieces, little rice pieces, and it's it's risen, it's it's brought up, and the curds are put into forms, this is when it gets its name, Parmigiano. Areggiano. And you know, you can go to the Ciao Italia website and you can find videos where we have been in Italy showing you how these processes occur. I don't have enough time here to tell you all about that. But this is the king of Italian cheeses. So please don't eat sawdust from a box because once you taste this, it's a revelation. Next slide. Another, another classic product, aceto balsamico tradizionale. D-O-P, again, those were those letters, D-O-P, denominazione origine protetta. In other words, this can only come from Modena, Modena and Reggio. And this is why you have these two bottles, because this is the real thing. And you will recognize the real thing by those words, aceto balsamico tradizionale D-O-P, but you'll also recognize it by the shape of the bottle. So these bottles are about 3.5 ounces each. This is Modena, this is Reggio. Now, this is a condimento. This isn't something that you're putting on your salad. No, this is, this is a, 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 starts out as a vinegar, but it becomes almost like, I don't know, a port. It's the only way I can describe it. You, it's very syrupy. I'm sure some of you have had it. How do they use this product in Italy? 
Well, this is used, drizzled over Parmigiano Reggiano. It's put on grilled meats or fish. It's used with fruit. It's also a topping for gelato, but it's a very specific product. It's not cheap. A little bottle like this is gonna set you back a few pennies. There are three grades of it. There's the gold, the auto, there's the argento, the silver, and there's the uh, aragosta, the lobster, the red label, which is the, the cheapest of them at starting probably at about $125. You can find these uh, online, but again, they are condiments. They're not called vinegar. And there's a huge process involved in how these are made. Again, you can go on our Chow Italia website and you can find more information about how these are, are made. Next slide. So I know I've been talking a long time and I'm just scratching the surface, but you probably should add this cookbook to your repertoire if you're serious about Italian regional food because Pellegrino Artuzzi, who was born in Forlimpopoli uh, in uh, Emilia Romagna, was the first person to really codify a book of regional Italian recipes that the average housewife could understand and do. So he put it into a context where it was familiar, familiar verbiage and the ease of preparation. So this book is kind of, it's still in print all these years later, it's still in print. And I once had the opportunity to teach uh, at, the, at the Artuzzi School in Forlimpopoli, uh, making some of the classic dishes uh, of, that, of that region. So I encourage you to, to take a deep, deeper look into regional Italian food by looking at uh, Pellegrino Artuzzi's uh, cookbook. Next slide. And that's a slide of us cooking, uh, bringing people from the States so they can better understand what it Italian regional food is all about. Here we are, this is the Artuzzi kitchen, and we are about to make something called piadina, which is the classic flatbread of the region. So it's, it's really when you're in tune with the ingredients, with the actual ingredients of the area, then you really come away with an understanding uh, of the food and what its importance is to that particular region. Next slide. And this is us in the studio bringing these classic dishes to you. As uh, Anna said earlier, this is our 30th year of production. And you would think that in 30 years, I have told you everything there is to know about Italian food. But I can tell you with certainty that I've only scratched the surface. I thank you for your attention. Well, Marianne, thank you so much for such a wonderful and meaningful talk. Thank you for honoring Italian history and food, you're right. Uh, they should never be separated. So thank you for that. And on a personal note, thank you for mentioning Puglia and its old olive trees. As yes. you said, the oldest in the world. My dad is gonna be so happy about <laughs> you mentioning it. So it's just gonna so celebrate in Italy, still up at 1 a.m. in Italy. Uh, also, thank you for mentioning the Parmigiano Reggiano that can only be from Reggio Emilia and Parma. And once again, I just don't want to keep quoting you, but I want to say thank you for mentioning, actually, thank you for advising people not to order a steak, a bistecca <laughs> with cappuccino. We actually did receive a question about that. So, so, thank yeah, you. Oh gosh, yeah. so thank you so much for mentioning that. I think it's very important. So I know that it's now time to... Um, open up for the Q&A section. We have so many comments, so many, um, so many questions. And so uh, my colleagues, Professor Boyley and Professor Gerke will uh, help me sharing them with you. I wanna start though with the first uh, comment was the first one, two minutes after your, uh, you starting doing uh, the talk. And this is Monica. And this is Monica comment. It's not a question, just a comment. I moved to New Hampshire as a very young adult with two babies. Mm. I had no family or friends here. My parents were born, were born from Germany and we never ate Italian food at all growing up. I've been watching and learning from you for over 30 years and I am now a very good cook, so congratulations. Thank <laughs> you for everything that you do. 
sign Monica. So thank you, Monica, for such a good um, opening. And thank you, Marianne. Thank you, and Marianne. Amy, do you have any question that you want to share? I do. OK, so um, our first question is from Lindsay. And she wants to know, which is your favorite food region in Italy? And, which, and, and where do you enjoy eating the most? It, that's a tough, that's like asking me which of my kids I like best because all the regions of Italy offer something unique and fabulous. But if I had to choose something, of course, because I'm of Southern Italian extraction, I would have to say Sicily because Sicily is the gateway to Italy. Without Sicily, Italy the, would not exist. Italy, uh, Sicily was what was known as the breadbasket of Italy because it provided all of the wheat that was that was used to make the breads that sustained the uh, the Roman uh, armies and the military. So Sicily to me is, um, you know, it's very special to me because half of my family is from there. But I love them all. There's, there isn't a region I haven't been in that I don't love. Okay, um, the next question, uh, I want to play off of something you said uh, about how in Italy it's so important to uh, only cook with things that with ingredients that are in season. Yeah. And we do have a lot of college students and maybe other people in the audience who are concerned with uh, budget or availability of ingredients. So we have a question from Camden. Uh, what do you think the role of budget ingredients is in authentic cuisine? Does substituting local in season ingredients for imported alternatives? take away from a dish's authenticity? Well, I think, yes, it does in, in a way. For instance, let's say right now it's artichoke season, okay? It's artichoke season, it's asparagus season. Our artichokes and asparagus aren't gonna taste anything like what you will find uh, in Italy, especially in Sicily, because you can, there, which they supply most of the artichokes for the mainland as well. But those artichokes, we grow the globe artichoke. That's what we can get. That comes from California. Now this thorny, um, but in Sicily, they grow the very small artichokes, which are thornless. You can eat the whole thing. They don't even have a choke. So let's say that you wanted to prepare them um, in umido. So you want to you want to stew them or do them in you know as the Neapolitans would say they're called drunken artichokes. So you go to the store here you buy your artichokes right. Then you would use your recipe, which tells you you're going to use olive oil. You're going to have onion. You're going to have garlic. You're going to have capers. You're going to have basil. Well, think about it. You can get good Italian olive oil, right? You can you can get uh, capers. You can get Italian capers, maybe the ones from Pantelleria because they're the best. And so you can approximate, like I said earlier, you will be able to approximate the flavor, but you won't be able to duplicate it because the artichoke will be different. But you will be able to use some of those products from Italy, even cheeses. You know, you you don't need a lot. I understand being on a budget. And Parmesan cheese is not cheap. Parmesan cheese is like $20 a pound right now. And with the tariffs on it right now, it's it's hard, you know, it's hard to it's hard to phantomize buying a big chunk of Parmigiano. But you know, a little goes a long way. So if you bought just a, a quarter of a pound, you know, and you when you grate it, you you got a little bundle there, you don't need, you don't need much. So use the ingredients, buy what Italian ingredients you can get here and use them sparingly, I would say. Thank you. So the next question is actually from one of our students at UNH, and she's asking, what was the first recipe you memorized or knew by heart? Oh my goodness. Well, the first, you, the first recipe I memorized was how to make a homemade pasta because I, there I was in a home. I was growing up with these two grandmothers. I just watched them, you know, they didn't have a recipe. I just watched them. So it, to this day, I don't have a recipe for making pasta. I can tell you to use large eggs. I can tell you to put four cups of flour on a board and make a hole in it. But now the rest of it's up to you, depending on the size of that egg, the eggs. You may need more flour. You may need less flour. You may, yeah, it's, everything is in the hands. So there's, it's, it's, it's trial and error. The way I explain it is think about a, an artist. He has a blank canvas, right? He has a blank canvas, but in his mind, 
he knows what colors he wants to use, right? So he knows colors go together, he's gonna to make a picture. Okay, the first couple of pictures he does, they're terrible, right? They're, they're, they're a mess, but then, you know, he, he's experimenting. So the first bunch of pasta you make, maybe comes out like a rock, it's not good. Okay, next time you do something a little different. Each time that you do this, you get better at it. It's like learning to ride a bike or learning to sew. Eventually it will be intuitive because that's what cooking is. Cooking is not, it's not on a board. It's not a recipe, it's a two of this and five of that. No, you open the refrigerator door. What do I have? What's in the pantry? That's gonna be dinner. Here's how I'm gonna put it together. So it's just having that confidence. Okay, listen, the first thing I made, I, I burnt the kitchen. You know, so I mean, I, you know, it was, <laughs> I, I've come a long way since then, but it's all because of trial and error. And I, that's, that's what I encourage people to do. Well, you may have already alluded to your answer to this in your last answer, but um, Professor Mara's students want to know more about who or what was your biggest culinary inspiration? My biggest culinary inspiration were my grandmothers and my mother. They were, they were the inspiration. In fact, in my first cookbook, I said that if I had, anybody had looked into a crystal ball and told me that I would be doing this, that I would be teaching Italian regional cooking, I would have choked on two meatballs because the last thing I wanted to do was cook like those women who, that, that was their whole life. That's what they did. On the hottest of August days, they were making 15 loaves of bread. You know, mm -hmm. they were canning cherries. They were singeing mm -hmm. chi chicken feathers. I didn't want to do any of that. <laughs> I, I, I was a teenager. I wanted to you know, have fun. Forget this. But you know what? Growing up in a family like that, it's ingrained in you. And so just by watching them, just by being in their presence, I knew this is what you had to do. Okay, and um, also, I guess, following up on that a little bit, um, Professor Mara's students also wanted to know, more broadly speaking, what does uh, being an Italian-American mean to you? What does what? I'm sorry. Being an Italian-American. What does being you? an Italian-American mean to me? I, it means everything to me. I, I would not have spent these last 30 years dedicating uh, my life to learning uh, about Italian regional food, Italian culture, people, places, things, anything Italian. I'm an Italophile. Uh, people can tell you that I'm constantly, you know, reading about Italy. I mean, people, other people read novels. I read books about, you know, how the Arabs came to Sicily. I mean, I just, I just love my heritage. And um, what can I say? It's, it's, it makes me realize that a lot of the accomplishments of the Western world were made by Italians, by whose names ended in A, E, I, O, scientists, uh, doctors, Dr. Fauci, um, you know, playwrights, people of all walks of life who've made wonderful contributions to our way of life were Italians. And that makes me very proud. Well, thank you for uh, Marianne, for the reference to the last name, we spoke a lot about uh, this uh, during the Italian American Lab uh, with UNH students, so thank you for that. But I should say, we received many, many questions about tomatoes, which is <laughs> interesting, and I love that. Actually, I also received email from colleagues commenting yeah. on tomatoes. But one question is from uh, Richard Floriani, uh, which is part of, I know that I told you personally about the two Italian American, three actually Italian American society, and he's part of the Bet for Italian Cultural Society. And he's um, asking about tomatoes and why, um, why they're so important and why um, Italian American food is centered around tomatoes. And he's asking if it's because of so many immigrants came from uh, Southern Italy. That's right. Uh, that is why the tomato is so important because yes, you, you have to realize that immigrants to this country for the most part were from Southern Italy. In 1890, 1900, 1910, those, that's when you saw the big waves of immigration come here. Most of these people were coming from places like Naples, they're like my grandmother from, from Avellino. They were coming from Sicily. They were coming from the poorer areas of Italy where the tomato was prominent. 
And so this, of course, became something that they adopted into their Italian American life. And that's so true about so many other things that we take here for being Italian. For instance, the Feast of the Seven Fishes. The Feast of the Seven Fishes is an Italian American invention. It has nothing to do with Italy. Every time I asked my Italian friends, are you doing the Feast of the Seven Fishes? What? You know, they, they had no idea what I was talking about. Because you have to realize that that feast is very big in New Orleans. And the reason it's big in New Orleans is because a lot of Sicilian immigrants settled in New Orleans, where they also do the, the, the tables of St. Joseph, the Tablo di San Giuseppe, which has just passed. And they brought what they knew, the, the, their, their idea of their foods with them. So obviously on Christmas Eve, which then in Italy and was La Vigilia, where you could not eat meat, you could only eat fish or non-meat dishes, what would they do? They would make a lot of fish or vegetable-based dishes because when Italians cook, they do it in abondanza. It's not like they're gonna make one dish or two dishes. They're gonna make a lot of dishes. It's part of the DNA of Italians to do this. And that's where that whole idea for, oh yeah, look at those Sicilians. They're making all those dishes for Christmas Eve. Uh, and then the, the story started to come, you know, why seven dishes? Well, seven sacraments, seven days that it took God to make the world. Then it went to 12 apostles. It's got 12 dishes now because it's 12 apostles. You see, this, this is part of the oral tradition that I was talking about earlier, that these things get tacked on. And then we start to believe that, you know, that's the original story when, you know, it, it, it obviously isn't. But the tomato plays a big part in uh, our culture because of what the Southern Italians, what they did with the tomato when, when they got here. So, you know, pizza, tomato sauce, spaghetti and meatballs, it, didn't, it doesn't exist in Italy, uh, are all part of our Italian American culture. Um, okay, so I have um, a question from Leah who would like to know what inspired you to think regionally, or if there was a particular moment that sparked your interest in thinking regionally about Italian food? Well, I, I think what sparked it was making that first trip to Italy when I, when I landed in Sorrento in, in a cooking school. And I was watching the chef who was half Austrian and half Italian making lasagna. And um, you, you know, b being there, was the light bulb, the light bulb went on. Mm. And I realized, wow, this is what they do down here, but they don't do this someplace else, you know? So that was it. When I made that first trip to Italy, I realized there's more to this <laughs> than just, well, you know, lasagna. It's a lot more, there's <laughs> porchetta, there's frico, <laughs> you know, there's uh, pesto, there, you know, there's caponata, there's, uh, you know. So yeah, that first trip pretty much cemented it for me. Okay, we have, um, we have here another question from Janet. Um, do you have a favorite Italian holiday dish to make? A favorite Italian holiday dish? Oh, mercy. <laughs> well, all, all, all holidays are, uh, are special, but... Uh, you know, like at Easter time, roast lamb, um, the torta pasqualina. I just made two colombe, which are the, the dove breads. Um, you, you know, I just, uh, I can't say that, you know, there's any one particular holiday that, that is super special, but we try to do capone for Christmas, capon, which is very traditional for Christmas with capoletti in brodo which is the first course used, the capon broth is used to, with, with the capoletti. So, you know, right after Thanksgiving, what I do, what was it? we have a tradition in the house where we, right after Thanksgiving, we start to make all the ravioli, the capoletti, get ready for, for Christmas. And then Christmas day, we have a capone. And then on New Year's, we have lentils and uh, salsicce, which is more typical that you would find in Italy. So, you know, we don't eat turkey on, on Thanksgiving. Thank you. 
We yeah. have a very, very specific question uh, from Cristiano. And this is a, since someone had a conversation around the house. And oh. this is the question. Do you, pee, do you put peas in your carbonara? So that's a very interesting, oh, no. very specific. <laughs> no. no. Eggs, cheese, and guanciale or pancetta. That's what you put in carbonara. And I know for sure, because we did it with my class, that yeah. there yeah. are more than one recipe for carbonara on your yeah. side. So shall we just suggest them yeah. to look it up? Perfect. Mm -hmm. But the classic one is just what I said, the carbonara. Eggs, cheese, and guanciale, which is pig's cheek if you can find it, or pancetta. But there's no cream, there's none of that, no. no. This is a very controversial topic. Yeah. Um, but since, since we're talking about peas, which are vegetables, um, we've had a lot of questions um, from vegetarians and about vegetarian dishes. And um, so they're wondering if you have a favorite vegetarian Italian dish to make. Oh my gosh, there, there's so many. Caponata comes to mind as one of my very favorites. This is to me the history of Sicily on a plate because caponata uh, is a mix of vegetables uh, and seasonings that came from other cultures. For instance, you know, the Arabs who introduced eggplant to, uh, to Sicily. They also introduced sugar. The Spaniards who introduced cocoa. Cocoa is an ingredient in classic uh, uh, caponata. Tomatoes are in, in caponata, onions, uh, capers. Uh, so that is, to me is a wonderful uh, vegetarian dish. Probably you would think of it more like a ratatouille, you know, on that and on, on that kind of uh, uh, level. Ciambotta is another word for a vegetable casserole where you've just you've sautéed a lot of different vegetables: zucchini, eggplant, um, mushrooms, whatever it is, and uh, you add a little bit of chicken broth or tomato uh, uh, sauce to it, and you mix it all up. So it's 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 a mixture. Um, but there, there are lots of vegetarian dishes on our website. I mean, one of the things that I love with peas, we were talking about peas earlier, something my mother used to make, which, which she called patches and peas. And patches and peas was homemade pasta where uh, the dough that was left over that was starting to get dry as they were re-rolling it, they would just cut it randomly and make like a maltagliati, which means badly cut pieces, just random pieces of pasta. But they cooked separately and then they combined with some peas and a little olive oil, salt, pepper, maybe some herbs. Uh, and they called it patches and peas. And that, see, that's how recipes develop. That's how they, they are created. Okay, I think um, I have another question here from, um, from Christina. What dish do your family members ask for most on special occasions? They love the timbalo di melanzane e bucatini. So in other words, you make a drum of, uh, you have a spring form pan and you have sweated down and then lightly uh, fried or baked long eggplant slices. And you drape it into a spring form pan, you make sure the bottom is covered. And then you have these long slices that are overlapping the edges of the pan. And then in the middle of this pan, you have placed a bucatini, which is a, a pasta, the thicker pasta that has a hole in the middle. That's what the word, the word comes from, bucatini. You have tiny meatballs, usually made with veal, uh, or they could be made with, uh, with beef, veal, and pork, or they could make with, be made with pork. So tiny meatballs, the bucatini in a tomato sauce, then you've got small pieces of uh, uh, mozzarella cheese, fior di latte, and then you fold the edges of the eggplant back over on top of all of this. You, brought, you, uh, you film the top with a good tomato sauce. You bake this in the oven. You say three Hail Marys. And when it comes out, you let it cool slightly because if you unlatch that immediately, you're having a mess. So you let it cool slightly. That's why I say, you say three Hail Marys. Then you unlatch it and you have this beautiful eggplant cake. You can find the recipe for this on, on Ciao Italia. The original place I had this was in an old crumbling palazzo in the middle of Palermo with a baron and a baronessa who opened their home to uh, the, um, 
the group that I was taking to Italy. And think about the leopard. If you've ever read the leopard, this is how the dining room looked. You were at you know, a football field sized dining room table and the waiters and, and, and uh, the camarieri and, and the, uh, the other kitchen staff were all in blue uniforms with gold buttons and gloves and they would serve you. It was like, you know, out of the leopard. So um, that became one of my favorites. I loved making that. And then when I made it the first time for my, uh, for my family, they loved this, mom, make that all the time. And you can make it in stages so it doesn't become overwhelming. Like you could, you could saute all of the eggplant ahead of time, put them in the refrigerator. The next day you could line the pan, you could have your tomato sauce made ahead of time. You know, part of cooking is, is also being able to um, prioritize and to think ahead and to prepare ahead as much as you can so that the task doesn't become overwhelming. So that if you made the meatballs ahead of time, the sauce was made ahead of time, you did the eggplant ahead of time, all you have to do is put it together, put it in the oven. People think you were at the stove all day and you're only there for 45 minutes. So the timbalo di melanzane e bucatini. After this, I think we are all super hungry. We need, <laughs> need some possibly good recipe from uh, your, from your site, Ciao Italia. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for your time, your kindness, and everything you're doing, not just today for the talk, but in general to preserve Italian culture. So thank you so much, Marianne, for being here with us. I also want to uh, let uh, everyone know that is still here, that you're coming back to, to UNH in the fall, and you're going to do a cooking demonstration. I'm going to make the timbalo. Yes, maybe you're going to make the timbalo. <laughs> that would be great. So uh, if okay. you want to to re keep receiving information, send me an email and I will update you with Mary Ann Esposito coming back to UNH in the fall. So thank you so much, Mary Ann. Ciao a tutti. Grazie mille. Buonanotte. Buonanotte, ciao, grazie. Ciao.